off of there again. And we'll be doing pretty much a similar type of thing that we did this morning. We'll be looking at several different scriptures. And these are all real basic things, real simple truths. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13. As soon as I get there, I'll read it to you. Praise God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? Verse 13 out of the Amplified says, The Father hath delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness, and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. So we understand what the Word of God says here, basically, as I shared this morning. When we come to Jesus Christ, when we're born again, we're basically translated from one kingdom to another, from one power to another, from one authority to another. We were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of His Son, in the kingdom of His light. And one of the things that I kind of use as a, a line of thought here for us to focus on, I use the idea that, you know, we go to school very often for years and years and years. Uh, some people go to school for 16 years, some people go for 18 years, 20 years for certain professions, and they're learning how to function in this world. They're learning how to function in this kingdom. Most people at least go to school for, you know, 10, 12 years or so, in most cases, to learn how to function in this world or learn how to function in this kingdom. But then they come and they come to Jesus Christ and they're born again, and for some reason they think that it's automatic on how they function in God's kingdom. And don't think they need to make a commitment to learn how to, how to live, how to operate in God's kingdom. But yet you'll find that the number one thing that Jesus taught about was how the kingdom of God works, how the kingdom of God functions, how the kingdom of God operates. He was constantly saying, well, such is the kingdom of God, such is the kingdom of God, such is the kingdom of God, constantly teaching about the kingdom of God and how to operate and function in that kingdom. And, and one of the things that I've come to, to believe over the years is a lot of Christians look at God's word, they understand the promises of God. A lot of Christians maybe hear the preacher stand up and preach about the promises of God and the blessings of God, and yet they grow very frustrated because they're not seeing those manifest or take place in their own life. And so what happens quite often, they'll, they'll fall out of church or they'll, they'll just get an attitude in their heart and, and grow bitter and, and, and you know, they'll maybe sit in the pews and, and you know, let it bounce off of them because they understand, oh yeah, but not me maybe. Not me. And not only understanding that what they're, in many cases, trying to do is trying to receive the blessings of God by using the world's devices. You know, the classic example who reads in the Bible that God wants to prosper somebody financially, and, and I knew an individual who did this and, and, and basically almost destroyed their life doing it. Well, God promises me prosperity, and I'm supposed to be head and not to tail, and, and all this stuff. And they went out and just basically worked themselves to death. I mean, just really wore themselves to a frazzle because they were trying to earn God's blessings or God's prosperity by working real hard and extra hard. Now, realizing that that's not the way that God meant for that to happen. Yes, we're supposed to work. Yes, hard work is a good thing in the eyes of God. But that's not how God planned on bringing His blessings and His prosperity into our life. And so they were frustrated trying to receive God's blessings by doing it the world's way. And as I've watched over the years and watched so many Christians, I'm absolutely convinced that that's probably one of the number one sources of most believers' frustrations that they run into that brick wall time and time again because they're trying to see God's blessings come to their life and they're trying to see it come by doing it the world's way. And when we were translated from the kingdom of darkness or from the authority of darkness into the kingdom of God, we stepped into a new lifestyle, so to speak. And Jesus taught us how to live that life. And Jesus' teachings were primarily teaching us how to live that life. As we talked about this morning, one of the key elements is what? The just shall live by faith. And so we walk by faith, not by sight. That's what the Word says. But yet I watch a lot of Christians' lives, and, 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 and many times people are walking by sight, not by faith. 
As a matter of fact, a lot of Christians are walking by sight and not by faith. A whole bunch of Christians are walking by sight and not by faith. Because we haven't really taken it upon ourselves to learn how to walk by faith. We haven't understood, maybe, that we needed to be taught how to walk by faith. And that doesn't mean you can have teaching, you can have that understanding, that revelation, but it's still not always easy, is it? So it's a lot easier sometimes to just go the way of the flesh. It's a lot easier sometimes just to go the way of the world rather than live according to God's Word and according to the faith that He teaches us. And so what I've been doing this, this Sunday is just kind of going over some really basic things, some really basic teachings about faith and living that way. Uh, there's a passage of scriptures in Luke chapter 13. If you want to go there, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Verses 10 through 17. And there was a lady who had been bound by Satan, by a deep money spirit, for 18 years. And she walked, and she was bound by being bound. She was all hunched over, and, and she couldn't straighten up. And, and whenever I read that, I, I have a very good visual of that, because I can remember years ago when I was a very young child, going down to my great-grandparents' farm in Kentucky. And there's not a whole lot I remember about that farm, except that the, the bathroom was way out in the field. And the, all the kids had to sleep in the attic, and it was extremely hot in the summertime to be in an attic in, in, in Kentucky, trust me. And one of the ladies who, who lived there, she wasn't family, she was a, a farmhand, whatever, uh, but she was that way. She couldn't straighten up, and everywhere she went, she walked like that, her name was Mabel. And so I had that real strong visual of her out working in the field and couldn't ever straighten up whenever I read this account of this lady. But this lady is all bold over and she can't straighten up. And the Bible tells us that she's been that way for 18 years. And she has been bound that way by Satan for 18 years. Now I want to read a verse to you out of chapter, Luke chapter uh, 13. And uh, let me illustrate one point that I'm trying to make with this scripture. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. And I'm going to read you verse number 16, I believe it is. Now this is Jesus, and he's being criticized for healing this woman, and so on and so forth. But notice verse 16. I'm not, I'm not this woman... Being a daughter of Abraham, now notice what's happened to her, whom Satan hath found. Lo, these 18 years being loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Now there's a couple things I want to bring our attention to here. Satan has this woman bound for 18 years. Now Jesus brings the point up, and Jesus said, Ought not this woman, this daughter of Abraham, be loose? Now, there's something there. Look at why does he refer to her as a daughter of Abraham? And why does he say, Ought not this woman, who is a daughter of Abraham, be loose? You know, we don't think of the word ought very often in our, in our time. We don't use that very often anymore. But the word ought is actually a very binding word. In other words, by saying, ought not this woman be loose, Jesus is saying, this woman who is in covenant with the Abrahamic covenant, this is a binding word. So she's in covenant. She's walking as a daughter of Abraham in a covenant of Abraham. Shouldn't she be loose? So in other words, he's alluding to the fact that she has deliverance in the Abrahamic covenant available to her. Follow me on that. He's alluding to the fact that this lady, this lady, should be loose. She has deliverance from this condition on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant in the Bible. But yet she's not. She is delivered from the power of darkness. But yet she is being bound by the power of darkness. She is delivered from the authority of darkness, but yet she's bound by darkness. In other words, what I'm getting at, there's a lot of believers who have been translated from the darkness into the kingdom of God, who have been translated from that kingdom into the kingdom of God, but still are walking in areas of darkness and areas of oppression.
when they should be delivered. That's what Jesus is saying now. He's saying, wait a second. This woman, you guys understand the Abrahamic covenant. This woman has deliverance that belongs to her. Should she not be delivered? Well, yes, she should be. Who's going to argue with Jesus? They did, and that's goofy. But why is it if she had deliverance that she was walking in bondage? And why is it that there are believers who have been delivered from the authority and the power of darkness who are still living in areas of oppression in their life? That's a real good question, isn't it? Because, you know what, we can all look at our lives and kind of think, yeah, there's, there's areas where I'm fighting some battles. There's areas where I'm fighting some struggles. There's areas where I know that, 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 that living for maybe years in the realm of that kingdom of darkness has affected me, and I've not been truly translated out of it, and truly renewed out of it, and truly walking in the fullness of what God has for me in those areas. And maybe some are saying, yeah, that's me, I'm really oppressed. I've got some areas where darkness rules my life. Ought not that woman to be delivered from the power and the authority of darkness? Ought not we, as God's children, who have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, should we, who have been delivered from his authority and his power, be walking in the fullness of what God has for us? Everybody says, yeah, I think we should. So, <clears throat> let's talk about that. Go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And, and that's kind of the theme. Maybe. How do we see these things manifest? How do we see them come to pass? How do we see them take place? Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Listen to this verse. Most of us are familiar with this. I've shared this verse a lot. This verse was the verse that really delivered me from a lot of things in my life. When I first come to Christ, this understanding of this verse set me free from a lot of things that were strongholds in my life. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. It says there we should not serve sin, doesn't it? We should not. Now let me read that to you. I'll be amplified. We know that our old unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body, which is the instrument of sin, might be made ineffective and inactive for evil, that we might no longer be the slaves of sin. I shared this before, and that particular verse, that when it says destroyed there, the Greek word there is better understood as rendered powerless. That old man, that old nature, that old part of us that held us in bondage to sin, when we come to Jesus Christ and place faith in the works of Jesus Christ, we understand that by faith, that old man, that old nature was pinned to the cross of Jesus Christ and died him to death, and was buried in his grave, and was resurrected unto the newness of life. We understand that, and that stronghold in our life was rendered powerless. In other words, it's just like unplugging a lamp and separating it from its power source. So we were separated from the power source in our life at that time. We were in the kingdom of darkness. We were under the enemy's authority, under the enemy's power. And when we were born again, we were translated into God's kingdom. And we were then unplugged from that kingdom and separated from that power source. But sometimes we still think like we're in the darkness. We still think like we're in that kingdom. We still think like we're under that thumb, under that power, under that authority. See, sometimes we've got to understand when we've been delivered from authority. <laughs> Let me give you an illustration. When I was in the Army, in basic training, my drill sergeant's favorite thing was push-ups. He just absolutely loved push-ups. He didn't care if we ever did anything else in the Army as long as we did push-ups. 
I mean, some of the drill sergeant team guys went out there be running all the time. He didn't care if we ran. We ran a little bit. We were doing push-ups while they were running. His favorite activity was to put us in all of our equipment with our bag uh, hats and everything on and go out to this really steep hill and do push-ups upside down with all that equipment on there. You got to try doing that sometime. It's really fun. Especially when you get tired and all that weight's pulling you this way. And you want to roll down in a hill. But he loved push-ups. <coughs> and, and, and in all honesty, every time I see that man's face, I had to do push-ups. There was just something about him. He'd see you say, Farmer's traffic, give me 20. <laughs> Farmer's traffic, give me 20. He knew my name well, and he knew push-ups well. And you know what he said? Farmer's traffic, give me 20. You know what I did? I did 20. He said, Farmer's traffic, do 40. You know what I did? I did 40. Whatever the number was, if I could do them, I did that many. But you know what? If I was walking down the street today and I see him, here, Farmer's traffic, drop him, give me 20. No, you drop him, give me 20. I ain't doing no more push-ups. Why? I've been delivered from his authority. He has no authority in my life at this time. I've been separated from his authority. So I don't have to do it. At that time, I, had, I was under that man's authority. And when he told me to do push-ups, I did push-ups. Why? Because I was under his authority. I made a choice at that time to submit myself to his authority, and that's the way it was. You see, when we're translated from the kingdom of darkness, we're no longer under the enemy's authority. But sometimes people don't realize that. And the devil says, hey, you remember how you used to do that? Come on, let's go do it again. Oh, okay. No! You've been separated from that authority. You don't have to do push-ups for the devil no more. Yeah. You don't have to do what he says anymore. You know, when, when sin becomes enticing you and, and he comes knocking on your door with those oppressions that he used to place upon you, you don't have to do that no more. Yeah. You've been set free and you've been delivered. But a lot of believers don't know that. You see, they don't know they've been, that they're not in the army anymore. When their drill sergeant says, give me push-ups, and say, well, he's done push-ups, they start doing push-ups. When sin knocks on the door, they go, well, I've, I've always, I've always, you know, whatever that happened, I've always been proud, so I guess I'll do it again. No. You've been separated from his authority. You've been separated from his power. He has no say-so in your life anymore. <coughs> he's not knocking on your door, now you've got authority in the name of Jesus. Be gone. We better, he's been rendered powerless in our life. Totally powerless. No authority in your life whatsoever. Only the way he can knock on your door and come into your life is when you open that door. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That's good news. Everybody says, yeah, but then I'm responsible to do something. Preacher? <laughs> uh -huh. Are they even doing push ups? Absolutely not. You see, the Bible teaches us time and time again about faith, doesn't it? And we studied that quite a bit this morning. And this too is an issue of faith. This too is an issue of faith. And I've shared with you before how when I first came out of the drugs and alcohol, that scripture set me free. And I don't talk about that all the time because I like talking about it. I don't know any better way to illustrate it in my life. But you know what? When he kept knocking on my door and, 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 he, and he came in the forms and shapes of different people I knew, he kept knocking on my door. Hey, you want to get high? Man, you're crazy. These are some of the best drugs we've had in a long time. No. Drug daddy, die. Hey, let's go have some drinks. No. Alcoholic. Die. That drug addict died on that cross. That drug addict was buried in a grave. And I was resurrected and I should have been to survive. The Holy Spirit made that such a reality in my life. It just seems so crazy the idea of doing drugs. Why would a dead 
just shall live by faith. You see what happens though? When it comes to an area like this, people are trying to do it with worldly means. <coughs> They're trying to do it with their willpower. They're trying to do it with their strength. They're trying to do it with their ability. They're trying to do it by trying harder to do it better. Jesus, wouldn't it? How 
done unto you. But the lady with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. But woman, thy faith has made thee whole. She blind me, Jesus. Jesus, have mercy on us. Come here, what do you want? I'd like to see you. Well, according to your faith, being done unto you. In other words, Jesus was time and time again stopping and bringing their attention that he's doing it by faith. So we don't have to sit and wonder the answer to that question. The greatest example of those working miracles among us was Jesus himself. And he proclaimed it time and time again. He was doing it by faith and not by the works of the law. He didn't say, oh, there you go, you're healed. That's what you get for obeying the Ten Commandments for a week. According to your faith, be it done unto you. Woman, well, thy faith has made me whole. There's a reason he stopped and brought that to our attention time and time again. There's a reason that that's recorded in the Bible. So that you and I will know the truth. That the way we receive from God is by faith and not by works. Hallelujah, that's good news. Did you receive the spirit, he asked them? By the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith? I mean, how long do you have to keep the Ten Commandments to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? That's a goofy question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How many church services do you have to attend in a row without missing any and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That sounds goofy, doesn't it? But there's been a lot of people who put a lot of rules on it. And a lot of stipulations. Well, if you dress a certain way, you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Really? There was a, a group that used to preach that if you want to baptize the Holy Spirit, you had to take all your jewelry off. Really? So God's saying, and I'm married, and I've got to take my wedding ring off and deny that covenant to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Men have come up with goofiest ideas all the time on, on how we receive things from God. And he makes it plain by the hearing of faith. You see, if we add any other thing to it than faith, then we make it human words. If I add things to it, then it becomes rules. And, and I've had that issue with people over the years. They say, well, you just need more rules. You don't receive anything from God by obeying rules. If the Holy Spirit's inside of you, you're going to live right. Hallelujah. If the Holy Spirit's inside of you, you're going to live right. If you're not living right, the Holy Spirit's going to talk to you about it, isn't he? And then you have a choice. You follow him, or you pursue sin. If you choose to pursue sin, sin you're rolling your dice and you're on your own. But the Holy Spirit inside you is really going to motivate you to live right. Amen? Amen. But we don't do it by rules. We don't do it by obeying the Ten Commandments. God's children live right because the Holy Spirit lives within them. We do it by walking in the Spirit. And when we walk in the Spirit, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? Amen. Not by rules. We don't receive from God by rules. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Where are we at? There's so much stuff in here. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. You guys are putting coats on and I'm up here. I think about throwing mine off. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And we looked at a couple of scriptures this morning. And those scriptures was. Yeah, he showed us the truth that God wants us to walk in it. And, you know, I, I read 3 John chapter, verse 2. Blood by which above all things that would prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Uh, I believe it's Psalm 34, 19 I read. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. And then God has a plan for our life, and that, that would be to prosper it, and for us to be in health. God has a plan for our life. And that is that, yes, we will go through a lot of battles and struggles, but his plan is that we walk out of them in victory. That's God's plan. Now, what happens again, like I was saying before, is a lot of times people aren't seeing that manifest because we're trying to do it our way. We're still trying to live life our way, 
We're still alive trying to live life the world's way, and we're not doing it God's way or according to His Word. All the blessings of God already belong to us in Christ. That's why we receive by faith. Amen? How can you do anything to earn what's already yours? If I have a big, giant Christmas tree up here, and I got everybody a big present underneath that Christmas tree, I say, guys, on Christmas Eve, we're going to have a service, and all you get to come have your presents. And every week, you come and say, Pastor, that looks like such a nice present. It's so big. I just hope I, I, hope I get it. What do I have to do to be sure I get that present? I mean, do I have to clean the church? Do I have to clean the parking lot? What do I have to do to get my present? That would be goofy. Because I've already bought the gift. And if it's a gift, it's a gift, right? Now, if I tell you that gift is yours, and when you show up at our service on Christmas Eve, you get that gift. And Christmas Eve comes, and you don't show up. And somebody says, why in the world didn't you come on Christmas Eve and get your gift? It was such a wonderful gift. He really had a gift for me. I didn't believe it. I, I didn't think he had a gift for me. I, I thought, you know, Pastor, he's kind of goofy. He likes to joke around and, and stuff all the time. I just knew it was a big joke. It never really wasn't any presents in there. You see, your unbelief can stop you from receiving that gift. But if it's a gift, you don't have to do anything to earn it. That gift is yours. And if God has given us something through Christ, what would we have to do to earn the gift that he's given us through Christ? Nothing. We would have to receive it by faith, would we? Did you ever wonder that? You your head and think, God, why is everything by faith? That don't make sense to me. I mean, I was always the kind of person, I tried to figure everything out all the time. You know, my aunt used to laugh at me, and her big disciple, like, you can't figure God out. I'm still trying, kind of. But I wonder, I asked God that question, God, why by faith? And you know why it's by faith? Because he's already given it to us through Christ. So if he's already given it to us as a gift, and it already belongs to us, how could we have to do something to receive it? Yeah. The only way we can ever receive it is just believe in here and take your gift. I mean, obviously, if it's a gift, we don't have to do works to earn it. If he's already given it, that'd be as goofy as the ask of Rachel the Mary. Well, that would be a dumb question, wouldn't it? Why? Because we're married. So if he's already given it, then it belongs to us. We just have to receive it by faith. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to get an English lesson. Most people flunk this English lesson. I've heard preachers preach this, and I hate to break their heart. But they, they preach this wrong all the time. <laughs> Bless me, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What, what do we have already? He's already blessed us with what? All spiritual blessings in Christ. So he's already given us the gift of all spiritual blessings in Christ. Anything we're ever going to receive from God the Father from now to now all eternity has already been purchased for us and already belongs to us in Christ. It's ours in Christ. Healing is ours in Christ. Salvation is ours in Christ. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is ours in Christ. Financial blessings are ours in Christ. It's already ours. We have to now receive it by faith. Here's the English lesson. Who hath blessed us? What tense is hath? It's the English lesson. It's a trick question now. Nobody's ever passed this when I'm giving this test. You just said it has. Huh? I did not. Pass. No. It's actually not passed. Yes. Hath is a continuous word. Oh. TH in the old English means continuous. Yes. Past 
means something that's already been done. Half means it's continually throughout eternity being done and it never stops. He not has past tense blessed us and quit. Yes, in past tense he did bless us, but he continues to bless us and throughout all eternity will bless us. It's a continuous activity that God is involved in. Constantly blessing us with all spiritual blessings. And it's already been done in Christ Jesus. Our part is to receive it by faith. How can you work and earn something that's already been given to you in Christ? Hallelujah. Y'all look at such deep thought. That is such good news. Whew. I'm glad I don't have to work for it. Because you know what? If God's keeping score, there's times I didn't do real good. There's times I would have lost ground. You see, 
In history, they call that revival. I, you know, I, I, over the years, I've done a lot of studies of revival, probably as much as any subject I've studied in my life. And you know what revival is? Revival is when God's word begins to be manifested in people's lives. That's all it is. Well, oh, remember the Thursday, had a great healing revival. You know what happened in a great healing revival? People got healed. And because God's promises that we all have began to be manifest, we call it a revival. <coughs> the Pentecostal revival of Azusa Street, we call it a revival. You know what happened in Azusa Street? People started getting baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. The promises of God began to be manifest, and we call it a revival. <coughs> Personally, I think that that's supposed to be normal Christian life. I believe we're supposed to see the Word of God manifest in our lives in a regular daily basis. Uh, where are we at? Yeah. I won't be too much longer. Head, Hebrews chapter 11. Last point. Has 15 sub points. No, I know. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This land and these buildings is a huge expense. 
Now, the businessman is going to take it and use his business skills to uh, hopefully to manage it and build it up, but he's got a track record for seven, seven days. The construction company is hopefully going to improve it, develop it, and, and you know, it'll be a nice tax revenue one day for the city. And he's using his track record as evidence. Well, my evidence is this. I know whatever I ever need for that property and that land God's going to provide it. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now the bank's probably not going to accept that. But it's evidence. And here's what I would present on that, with that evidence of God's word. Would you put your trust in God's word? Or would you put it in the businessman's word? Would you like to trust God in his word, or would you put your trust in a businessman? See, there's a... I decided we're going to be a successful businessman. I've used the a few times. You know, Donald Trump's got a few bankruptcies in his past. Maybe not a stretch of business. So would, would you trust, you trust God's word as a reference for that businessman's scrap record as evidence? Would you trust God's word as evidence or that construction company's word is that it is. That man might die tomorrow. He might go bankrupt tomorrow. FBI might raid his office tomorrow, found out he'd been corrupt all these years, and take and seize the land and keep it. Which would you trust as evidence? You see, faith is the evidence of things not seen. We have got faith is taking God's word as evidence in our life above all else. If it's down to my emotions and God's word, I have to take God's word as my evidence. If it comes down to my reasoning and God's word, I have to take God's word as evidence. You know, I always tell the chess story. Everybody remember the chess story? Mm -hmm. Which one? If you remember, you got to preach it. <laughs> I always use this example when it comes to my reasoning. How many of you, other than me, have had times in your life when you are absolutely 100% convinced and sure that you were right about something? I mean, you, you might be wrong on some things, but this time you knew that you knew that you knew that you knew you were right. And you would argue with anybody and stake your life on it, and then two seconds later found out you were wrong. You know one of the ways that I always use the example that I see that a lot is playing chess. There's times that I've said and I've thought and I've thought and I've thought and I've thought, I just played a chess game and I'm still playing this chess game on the internet with this guy from Israel. And, 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 and I sit down and I had my plan and I had my strategy and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is so easy. I had like, I'm 15 moves in the game, I'm getting ready to checkmate this dude. 35 moves later, my plan didn't work because there was something I didn't see. I thought through a whole bunch of times. I wanted to be sure because I was going to make a sacrifice of some pieces that I didn't want to sacrifice unless I was right. And guess what? I was wrong. So based on my track record of many times being knowing that I'm right, beyond a shadow of a doubt and finding out I could still be wrong, I personally choose to accept God's word as evidence and not my thinking. And I would suggest you do likewise. You see, faith is accepting this as the evidence in life. And whatever situation we're in, faith says, this is my evidence that I'm going to act on. This is my evidence that I'm going to walk out on. I'm going to stand on the word of God that is settled in the mind of God for all eternity. And more and more as I follow the Lord, I just, I, I just think about that more and more and more. Is how simple it is. Why would we ever trust anything other than God's word? I mean, really, what have you found in life that is trustworthy? Have you found our government to be trustworthy? Mm -hmm. Have you found your family members to be trustworthy? I mean, they might be good people, honest people, loving people, but you know the thing is with humans? Sometimes we can mean to do something with all of our heart and fail because of human abilities, lacks. 
Sometimes we can't follow through with our promises, not because we don't want to, but because our abilities can't do it. I've not found anything in this world to be absolutely trustworthy other than God's word. I've never had a family member. I've never had a friend. I've never even found myself to be that trustworthy. Because I'll be honest, there's times I've let myself down. Many times. So I choose my evidence in life to be God's word. Amen? Amen. Yeah. We should go. Do you want to do it? Let's go.